So I'm going to move the mic because I always got to be extra, as my niece calls me. Um, Jenny Vandermeer said that the people who are not going to be able to do this, they are not going to be able to do this. So in my language in Deneke, which um, in English is North Slavey, I just introduced myself. My name is Jenny Vandermeer. I'm originally from Delaney, but I live in Norman Wells. And I just want to thank um, the organizers for inviting me. I truly appreciate this uh, opportunity. And I'm not a doctor. <laughs> we had like three doctors in a row. Um, I am by no means an expert in wellness. Um, I'm actually a, a wildlife biologist, but I do have an, an uh, interest in wellness and an interest in culture because of my own experience. So in terms of health and wellness, I find that a lot of people, and it's not meant in any kind of disrespect, a lot of people typically say, oh, well, Indigenous people have these issues, or people in our communities are having these issues, or, you know, they should go get help, they should go get treatment, and it's always a they, they, they thing. And it's not very often that people really think about themselves and their mental health and their well-being. And so, I got to go back a bit to tell you my story about how I got to where I am today. So I grew up in Delaney. And my mom was raised in the bush, Dishinta. So I was the first of my generation to be raised in the community. My mom went to residential school in Inuvik. However, she didn't talk about it. So I didn't even know about residential school until I was in my 30s. So I saw a lot of dysfunction in the community, but there was also dysfunction in my home. My stepfather was a white settler, and he had... Um, addictions issues, drugs and alcohol. So there was violence and there was addictions in my home growing up. So I saw my dad being violent with my mom from a very young age. So this took a toll on me. As a teenager, I was very insecure. I was depressed. I had anxiety all the time. And the only thing that really helped me was alcohol. When I drank, I was the life of the party. I'm sure some people here kind of remember that still, but I was lots of fun. <laughs> I'm still fun, but just like a little tamer. <laughs> but yeah, it was, so it was alcohol, and I'm not talking about having a few drinks here and there. I'm talking to the point where I was getting blacked out drunk maybe four or five times a week, and I started getting into hard drugs. And this was the time when fentanyl was coming out, so it was extremely risky, me being a single mom to be doing these types of things, to cope with all the pain and the trauma that I had witnessed as a child. So in my adult life, instead of breaking that cycle, I continued it. I brought alcohol and I brought violence into my home. I was with a man, my child's father, who um, didn't treat me very well. He was physically abusive. And that just fueled more of the trauma and the dysfunction. And that continued for several years. And there, there finally came a point in my life when I knew that if I didn't stop the way I was behaving and get help, that I wouldn't make it past the next day. Either I take somebody's life by, you know, drinking and driving or something like that, or else I would end my life because I was so depressed and I was just, I couldn't live that way any longer. So with that decision being made, I decided it was time to move back to the Satu region. I'd been gone from the Satu since I was about 16, pursuing post-secondary and just living in Yellowknife and other countries across Canada. I knew that I needed to get rooted within my culture and be closer to family in order to heal. So all the speakers before me are mentioning that Indigenous people know what they need in order to heal. And I did, without even actually like knowing it, deep within me I knew that if I returned to my community, or close to my community, or returned to my home, that I could start the, the long healing process. So with that being said, the first few months of my sobriety were, were horrible. That was the first time I'd ever experienced feelings, because I'd numbed myself for so long. 
that to even feel happy or sad or angry was, was a foreign concept to me. So allowing myself to feel that, I felt like a crazy person. I couldn't handle it. So I needed an outlet. So I turned to exercise and I turned to nutrition. And then I started sharing my journey on social media and I started talking to people about it because they were like, oh, I see you're working out and you're getting sober now, that's great. And I'm like, yeah, we'll see what happens with it. And then I decided to get further training it in, in nutrition and fitness. So I've got several certifications and I've been working with women across the Northwest Territories, across Canada and even in the United States on their mental and physical well-being as well as their spiritual and emotional. I think it's a whole big picture that you need to focus on when it comes to health. However, when I first started my journey, I was only thinking about, I need to work out so that I don't drink. And I need to lose weight because everybody says, if you quit drinking, you lose weight, which is total BS, by the way. So that was my focus in the beginning, which was a very um, westernized way of thinking about health, being that, Skinniness equals health. That's not the case at all. And it wasn't until I started working on my, my, um, my stuff that I realized that to be a whole person and to be healthy meant that I needed to reclaim who I was and my identity as a Dene woman. I get my strength and I am resilient because I am Dene and I get it from my family. I think about all the women that have come before me, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, my mother, and they are powerful examples of resilience. And their power runs through my veins. And I think about that a lot, especially when times get tough, because a lot of people think that once you quit drinking or once you get healthy, everything is rosy, everything is perfect, but that's not the case. I have to deal with life now without that crutch and learning how to be a healthy, happy person. It's hard, it's really difficult, but I've found that by sharing my experience with people, going into the schools to talk to girls, hosting workshops, going on social media, I'm finding a huge community of supporters and people who are on similar paths as me. So we're able to reach out to each other. It's been amazing. So I think that if anyone is struggling and you think that there's, there's no way you can, you can get out, it, it's, it is possible. I'm an example of that. I used my culture, my language, talking to elders, listening to recordings of my grandmother and my elders to help me get through going to see a counselor, which is really hard in communities where there isn't a counselor. But you, like, you need to p try as much as you possibly can because there is no one size fits all. You try as much as you can and you adapt. As indigenous people, we're extremely strong and resilient. The very fact that I'm standing here today talking to you goes to show how strong we are. And so I choose to honor my body, I choose to honor my time on earth because my ancestors paved the way. They did so much for me to be here today and it would be disrespectful of me not to honor that. There's this one term that my family uses to me when I'm going through a hard time. In Deneke, they say, remember, which means we are strong. And to me, it means we're resilient is really what it is. So with that, I just wanted to leave there. Merci.